First of all, I got to say a gigantic thank you to Will Sillen. I absolutely loved his murals, and I like to use them whenever possible uh, as an intro to the environment that we're talking about. Uh, just a little bit of geology reminder. Uh, we are looking at a very early Jurassic uh, black shale formation. This is part of the Rift Valley uh, sediments that were occurring. And every 40,000 years or so, uh, there seemed to be the development of a lake over uh, a short sequence of time. And the magic of all of this is that all of these different layers, sandstone layers of tracks and black shale layers uh, with lake sediment are all pr present in one location. And Dick Little spent a wonderful afternoon showing me all of this. So now we're going to start in. And uh, my first job in doing it was to learn what I was looking for. And the black shale, if you can see with my finger here, this is a black shale uh, rock. And you notice there's some markings in the rock. And that's indicative that there's something hidden inside. Wonder what that could be. Well, one of the things that I learned to do early on was to take x-rays. If you can get a specimen that's thin enough, you can get a wonderful x-ray. And here's an x-ray of a piece of rock with a fish inside. And if you see all the little white dots, those are called co copper lists. Those copper lights are fish poops. And those are the small ones of the semionoted, which is the fish that we see here. So that became a side hobby, making side tracks to the x-ray department every so often. Sometimes, instead of a flat plane of rock, we would get a nodule, such as this. And nodules are when the sediment forms around a nucleus of some kind, and then eventually uh, lithifies to become a rock. And you crack them open, it's like geodes, and oh my goodness, this one has got fish scales and parts of a fish inside. Now, what's the environment that this is in? We're in a lake bed environment. And if the depth is over about 50 feet, the environment is anoxic. And that's important because rotting will not occur if there's no oxygen. And if we're lucky, we'll get things like this. Here we have an intact fish that was buried inside the rock. You can see where I had to dig into the rock to get it out. And that's a long painstaking process to chip off the rock and expose the fossil. Something that we should always remember when we look at these specimens, here's another fish with a couple of fins off on the edge but never forget to look at the backside. Oh my gosh, there's another fish, complete with a sign that says turn over to see the first side. Now, I mentioned that these things tend to uh, rot or may rot if the anoxic conditions aren't perfect. So here's a specimen that shows what can go right and everything that can go wrong. In the center, we have a nice fish right located in the middle of a plate, ah, just like we like it. But, oh my goodness, we chopped off a fish over here. And when collecting these specimens in the rock, you have to remember to go as large as possible. That gives you a chance to get the whole fish. If all you take are little pieces out, all you will ever get are little fragments of fish, and this is a common phenomenon. Oh my, well, this is preserved, but if it's not perfectly hypoxic and some rotting occurs, we get events like this, where we have just a part of a body that's left, and here's a little less that's left. Let's look at this one up here. Here's one of the larger fish. I'll put a ruler on there. 
that's a six inch ruler. So this guy is maybe eight inches, but he was originally a lot longer than that. Some rotting has occurred. He's lost part of his tail. Gas is built up in his head and he's blown his head off. So all we have in reality is his body. And oh my goodness, look at this. If I run my finger from left to right, it falls off about four millimeter. There's been a small fault and this portion of the fish has been lifted upward relative to this. That's a tiny fault line and that's indicative of the tectonic activity that's been going on. Now, there's the predominant fish in the formation is the semionoted. And uh, all of the upper layers have nothing but semionoted, but the lower oldest layers do have mixed fauna. The largest fish that I've ever removed is this one here. And you can see that it's probably about a foot long. So they come in large, medium, and smaller sizes over here, here, and here. There's a tiny one. And look, you can look at this. Here's short fat, long skinny, and here's a small baby one. The baby fish fossils or the small ones are almost never obtained. There's not enough, quote, meat in them to preserve it well enough to be harvested and examined. Now, two more specimens over here show the decomposition. We looked at a specimen where the head was blown off with gas. Here, there's a belly blow. And if you look here, you can see gas is accumulated in the belly, has blown it apart. And we see some of the ribs that are up there. These are the most difficult to prepare of all the specimens, are these parcel specimens like this. And if decomposition is allowed to go on, if there's enough oxygen down there, we get these little piles of bones and scales. So this is a more fully decomposed fish specimen. Okay, every once in a while, we get some special forms. Here's a curved one. This is a semionoted, and the head is actually lower than the tail. So I think this nose dived into the lake bed and then kind of fell over making a unique form. Sometimes these curved ones turn out to be something else. Fish are not the only thing that we find in here. We find other things and we talked about the coprolites. Here's one buried inside the rock that has not been exposed. Here is a nodule. And if you look carefully, you crack the nodule open, you can see it's a coprolite. And you can see it running the length of the specimen. And these are actually tapered. If you have a fully developed form like here, it's full at this end and it tapers down to that end. Here is the top and the bottom of a large coprolite this would be from a diplurus, the largest fish in the pond. And I never did find one myself, only one was found in this formation. Um, but they leave these wonderful large coprolites. Now, you can, by looking at sequential layers, what I learned to do at the very, very beginning of this was to keep a log. And in that log, record how deep I was in the formation each time I uh, would take something out. And when I found something, I would know exactly where it was. So I learned at what levels the fish were located. There were several more layers where lots of fish were, but one of the densest layers was at the top of the formation where there's this mass mortality layer multiple fish and coprolites are present in this layer near the 
top end of the formation. And just above this layer is the final evidence of life. There's a sandstone layer with just some fish scales in it. So I think there's a shock to the lake that's going on. It's killing off the last of the fish. Here's the last remains. Then there's a layer with these kind of uh, desiccation marks resembling mud cracks. And then that's the end of the black shale. It turns into sandstone. So I think we can trace the history of a lake through this. Now, something else that I like to demonstrate through the specimens that I have are evidence of tectonic activity. Well, and you can, yes. Oh, I, I really apologize for interrupting, but you're just about out of time. And there is a question about the time period we're talking about. Okay. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is very early Jurassic, or as some folks would like to say, very late Triassic. It's right at about that junction. Okay, you've got about one minute left. Okay, uh, one of the things that I like to do is show evidence of tectonic activity. Here is a specimen, if I can tilt it, you can see the shine of a silicon side. There was a layer of rock on top of this that slid over the top of this and polished it. And if you look carefully, there's a fish hidden in there. Here's the stretch marks where the hard clay, it hasn't lithified yet, has moved the right relative to the left, and then it lithified, preserving these little stretch marks. And perhaps the specimen that uh, most famous for is this one here. This is a picture in Dick Little's book where the left half has been moved upwards about an inch relative to the right half in a simple strike slip fault. So that's a quick run of some of the um, things that I have uh, collected from the black shale. Uh, just one other final thing is evidence of what I call a fossilized earthquake. This is um, fault zone breca. It's basalt from the Cheapside quarry. It's been as the uh, one layer is ground against another. All of these pieces are broken off and then it's filled in with calcite. So this is another fossilized quake. And this is a little subtopic I love to find evidence of. And this is just another one here where there is a fault line here and this band of color has been moved upwards from here relative to this.